Welcome and hello. Um, thank you all of you uh, free software users, developers, enthusiasts. Um, I'm Corbin Champion. I'm Matt Tai. Uh, I'm the general manager of Userland Technologies. I'm just a software engineer. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually, he's humble, he's really good. And he's been with us since uh, before Userland was called Userland, back when it was uh, Ganeer Debian. Yeah. Way back in the day. Yeah, way back in the day. All right, it's up there. Like two all years right. ago. Oh, and also, <laughs> welcome and hello to all you people on the live stream. Um, oh yeah. Very excited to have you. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to tell you about Userland Technologies. But before we get too deep into that, we're going to take a few steps back, I tell you about, um, I have it here. we're still getting someone else's mic. I just haven't had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's better. Um, we're going we're to take a step back, tell you about the problem we're trying to solve. Then we're going to take a step forward, tell you about what we've done about it so far, and then one more step into the future and tell you about what we plan on doing about it next. Right. So we live in this really interesting time. Um, we have these devices with us at all times, whether that be for better or for worse. Um, this could be when you're chilling with your friends at the cafe. Or as the case maybe if you're alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, this lady's like me. I mean, two, t two devices out, headphones at standby, uh, you know, no one sitting near me, uh, introvert's dream come true. And it's not just there. You know, you could be traveling halfway across the world speaking to people in the exotic locale of Bristol, UK, and you've still got one of these in your pocket. Um, <laughs> yeah, and these things aren't a snooze. I mean... This is a multi-core processor, gigs of RAM, gigs of storage, Linux kernel or Linux light kernel if you're an iOS user. Um, this is a powerful thing. But despite, you know, other than communication, people seem to want you to use this thing for Angry Birds or the Minions game. Oh, I thought we were going to ignore that one. Ac actually, my son helped me get to level 10 last night, so I'm pretty... <laughs> I feel like you want me to be proud of you for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, so, you know, so, but seriously, I'm not knocking entertainment. I mean, entertainment has a value, human value. Uh, it also has a financial value. I mean, these companies make these games, these apps, this music, and they do it for a reason. But some of us want to go a little bit further. Some of us want to do a little bit more. Some of us want to do stuff like that. Um, this could be for work or for school or for fun. Um, if you're also one of those people that considers this kind of thing fun, which these I'm sure most of us these are. People <laughs> do. These people do. These are my people. Yeah. Um, and, oh, yeah. Uh, but for Corbin and I, people that have our work laptops, have desktops at home, really the key value in these devices is that they're mobile. But we're not the only people using our app. When I think about people using Userland, I am thinking about people like the youth of today, who more and more often are being bought mobile devices as their only computing platform. And sure, plenty of them are gonna wanna just talk to their friends, or maybe walk around the park playing Pokemon Go, or whatever kids are doing these days. But some of those kids are gonna wanna be able to do a little bit more. Yeah, the budding devices. nerds of the world. Those ones. And they're not the only ones. Your kids. People in developing nations all over the world will often only have a mobile device as a computing platform. And we want to empower these people to use that device however they want to. Right, I can vouch for this. I actually visited a Maasai village a few years back. Wow, you look right at home there. <laughs> hey, 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 wait, wait. They let me dance with them and everything. Uh, I left that out of the slide deck. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and actually one of these guys um, was an as electrical engineering student home for the summer. And uh, yeah, he might want to like, talk to his friends or play games, but like, yeah, he might want to do more. He might want to do like some of his homework or study up or, or collaborate with us. <laughs> and so that's exactly where Userland comes in. We want to transform people's mobile devices from the playthings that they've been into the actual computing devices that they are. Yeah, and you don't have to wait. Um, if you're an Android user, Userland is already in the Play Store. Um, we have, we were, we've been on production release for about three weeks. Uh, we were beta before that for several months. We have tens of thousands of users starting to get good reviews from people. Um, it's available, and you can start turning your phone into that powerful computing device. Right. And so now that you guys kind of have the 10,000 foot view, we thought we'd take you on a brief tour of what the app looks like in its current iteration. And so when you boot it up for the first time, this is the page you're going to be greeted by. This is the apps page. Yeah, apps. That's a clever <laughs> name. Yeah, we spent a long time thinking up that one. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so as you can see, uh, this is apps, this is our newest feature. What we're trying to give here is kind of a single click point of entry into a, a Linux distribution or Linux applications. 
As you can see, you can hop right into Ubuntu or Debian currently, but you can also go through more complicated automatic setup to do things like Firefox or Octave, which is a free and open source mathematical computation tool, kind of similar to MATLAB. Uh, and we think there's a lot of power in this, a lot of ease of use in this, but we know a lot of our users are gonna want a little bit more custom customizability uh, when they're using our app, and that's where sessions come in. As you can see, we've generated a few for apps, but what sessions are is it's kind of the idea that encapsulates running a server locally on your device. Right now we support SSH if you're more of a command line guru, or VNC if you're looking for a little bit more of a graphical setup. Um, and so yeah, there's a little more customizability here, but none of this would matter if you didn't have a file system to run anything on. Again, you can see we've set up one for apps for people that are going through that kind of flow, um, but you can make your own. Right now, as I kind of alluded to, we support Ubuntu and Debian, and these file systems look just like what you would be used to seeing on a Linux distribution. Everything from Etsy to your slash home away from home is gonna be <laughs> on there. Um, and so yeah, all these things kind of combine to allow people to hop right into Linux on their mobile devices. Yeah, so let's show them that. So um, this is, as you mentioned, you could be in a VNC session or an SSH session. This is obviously VNC, um, but this is, this is my, this phone. Um, and I've launched straight into LXDE. Uh, I've opened up Octave. I've plotted something like a Sombrero plot through GNU plot. That used to be the Octave logo, actually. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> but this is just an example. The point is, is like, it's your box. You do what you want. Now, if you want to hit the command line instead, um, we can launch into an SSH client app. Um, you could do this for you know, editing text through Vim or, or Emacs. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll stay Let's away from that battle. Let's not start a flame Or you could be like compiling your code, you could be executing your code, or you could be play, playing an interactive fiction game like Zork. Which is a classic I'm sure you've all heard of. <laughs> it, it's, it's a more elegant game from a more civilized age. Uh, but so yeah, now that you've kind of seen what the app looks like, we thought we'd break down into a little bit more of a technical discussion, tell you how things kind of work to give you this um, Linux power on your mobile devices. And so to our users, it looks a lot like a standard Android application. It installs and uninstalls from the Play Store like normal, launches from your home launcher, whatever it may be, like normal. Um, on the Android side, the most special thing about it probably is that we've chosen to write it all in Kotlin which for those who don't know yet, is a newer language with J uh, JVM interoperability, and as language features, it focuses on things like expressiveness, conciseness, readability, and safety. And this has allowed our team to iterate a lot more quickly and build a more robust code base. But most importantly, it means we have yet to write a single line of Java. Yeah, now Matt's not lying. I mean, our app does un install and uninstall like normal. Um, but once you look underneath the hood, it's nothing like a normal app. Um, there's a lot of black magic going on that makes it look a lot different than a normal app. This includes custom scripts and executables uh, that allow us to create these file systems and to launch into the sessions that Matt was talking about. And one such example is Pyroot. Now, Pyroot is a free and open source piece of software. It allows you to create a user space implementation of chroot. Um, we obviously use it to run your chroot. Um, it acts kind of like a man-in-the-middle attack on system calls. So normally, a user space application would talk to the kernel through system calls, um, but pROOT's actually running, and it's p-tracing your application, and it's looking at what system calls you're performing, looking at their arguments, and manipulating them when necessary. An obvious example of that is, hey, we're trying to do a chroot. So if the system call includes an argument that relates to path, we're going to add a prefix to the beginning of that path to point to where your file system really lives on your Android device. Um, beyond that, pROOT supports extensions. Uh, extensions can be really kind of anything, um, but we use several custom extensions uh, for the purpose of getting around kind of the way that Android is different than normal GNU Linux. Now, one example of that is uh, we want our app, and our app does run as when you're, you, do, you do not have to root your device. Uh, but we want you to be able to like install packages and stuff that normally require root. So we can actually fake that out. Like if, if, if your program says, who am I? We can like say, you're root, uh, even if you're not. Now we can also emulate that you're, that you're any user. Uh, we have an extra extension that makes it so we emulate users and permissions such that it looks like to you and to your applications like a normal GNU Linux environment. Now we don't stop there. There's more black magic. Um, 
So we do a very similar trick, but with function calls. We use LD preload, uh, which takes advantage of the dynamic linker's kind of just normal behavior, but preloads before any other object a custom shared library or libraries um, that you provide, or in, in our case, that we provide. Um, now, this is done because uh, some things are too abstract to handle at the system call level. You need to like handle them at a higher, le higher level where you know what's going on. Now, um, the way it works is very similar to pre-root in that uh, the function call happens. Normally, it would just go straight to like some standard shared library like glibc. But instead, since the custom shared library has been preloaded, if that custom shared library has the same function name as some function name that would have been found in glibc in my example, it'll use our custom version instead of the normal one. Um, All right, Professor Snape, that's probably enough black magic lectures. Uh, why don't you let me tell them where we're going next? So obviously, we're going to keep bringing more apps in the user land sense, more distributions. But we're also coming to more platform distribution, or distribution platforms, excuse me. Uh, we're going to be coming to F-Droid, hopefully as soon as possible. We're going to be coming to the Amazon App Store, some Chinese distribution platforms like Tencent. But most excitingly, we're actually going to be coming to iOS as well. Uh, I iOS? Like, like all that black magic we've been talking about doesn't work on iOS, so what's the deal? Right. So we've decided to hop over Apple's walled garden by doing what every other technology company is doing these days. We're going to bring user land to the cloud. Uh, the cloud? Yep. So what we've done is we've built a custom container networking solution that will allow us to quickly spin up and spin down Linux boxes in the cloud, all while persisting users' file systems so that their work never disappears. Um, and we're trying to get this done as you know, reliably and cheaply as possible. And then we'll connect to those boxes through our client-side apps, which will allow us to finally come to iOS. And of course, we'll be adding this functionality to our Android app as well. Uh, that, that sounds really cool, but that also sounds pretty difficult. I mean, when can people expect <laughs> to be seeing this in action? Uh, would it shock you if I told you we had a workable demo today? No, we worked on these slides together, but th they might be surprised. <laughs> cool. Well, let's show it off then. Uh, so what you're going to be seeing here is we're going to repeat a couple tasks, both locally on an Android device and then remotely on a cloud box. We're going to be printing the system architecture, so locally you'll be able to see that it's indeed running on like an ARM64 device. Um, where is in, in the cloud, it's going to be an x86-64 device. Uh, and we'll also be printing the IP address so that you can indeed see that the remote one looks like the kind of random remote IP you would expect. Yeah, now wh why would you want to do this? I mean, running in the cloud has some benefits, obvious benefits like iOS. We can support other platforms where we can't play our, our tricks. Um, but in addition to that, it might save you battery life. Now going beyond that, we fake out root. When you run your cloud box, you can be real root, and that'll allow you to do a few things you can't do inside user land right now. Now, in addition, as he said, it's x86, so like some programs don't run on ARM, so th you might be able to do something in the cloud you couldn't do otherwise. And then lastly, you might like you might be like doing something like running your own Minecraft server, and that's something that you'd want to connect to the rest of the world. So running it in the cloud makes much more sense than running it local. Um, and I know because you guys are all nerds like me that some of you are out there thinking, well, what's the point of that? I can just go to AWS or some other cloud competitor or shit, spin up my own server at home. Um, and what we're really trying to do is we're trying to have an easy, affordable way for our users all over the world to be able to start up boxes in the cloud. Yeah. So now that you've seen those slides, you saw the demo, you've heard us talk, you're really excited. Um, you're probably downloading Userland right now. And your only question is like, how can I help these guys out? That is a lot of assumptions. I, I could, th they're pretty excited. <laughs> I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> so if the answer is GitHub, right? So uh, we want to be open about everything we're doing, about what issues we're having, wh what our roadmap looks like. But of course, we're being free and open with our code. So you can join us on GitHub. If you're technical and you want to do some programming with us, come write some Kotlin with Matt. Or if you're more of a masochist, come write some C with Courtney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could do that. Um, but you can go beyond that. Say you've got like a designer's eye, and you want to help us with our UX UI flow. Which we could desperately need, Yeah, you could, <laughs> you could do that. And, and if, if you're non-technical or you have other skills, like come help us with translations. Maybe you know a, a language we don't know. Which would be any except for English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the last thing is you could just be a good user. Uh, download the app. Try it out. Give us feedback, good or mm, bad. Uh, and tell your friends. You know, the more eyes that we have on this, the better, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, 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 before we before we wrap up, I just want to know: Does like anyone out there have Userland on their phone right now? And if no one does, could someone in these first few rows raise their hands before this gets too weird? 
Oh, cool. Yeah, okay, cool. cool. We got like five downloads out there. That's great. We're like blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, okay, okay, good, good, good. All right, so you, actually, I saw this hand go up first. You, I'm going to walk up there. You get this one and only custom userland sticker. I'm sorry, everyone else. Wow, that's, uh, that's a little stingy there. We're Kevin. a free software <laughs> company. <laughs> <So> <laughs> well, thankfully, I came a little bit prepared, so I'm going to give some more out. Uh, or you can probably come find me after this talk. And, uh, you know, I think we've got a little bit of extra time before we go to lunch. So if anybody has any yeah. questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. All right, bring it. Sure. So we need to finish the work to put on Neftroid effectively because right now it's Play Store dependent. If you were to not use the Play Store, you might have an issue. What's in there that's Play Store dependent? Well, I think you actually might have fixed it, but you, we had yeah. an issue where if you didn't have Play Store, it would crash. Um, no, because because it actually did like the Play Store forever, intent, yeah. like you know, to down. Yeah. Let's say you need to connect mod, it would connect okay. to it. Um, so it actually might work right now, um, but we I should put the side loaded APK up on the GitHub page. And yeah, that's been it. something that we've just been forgetting to do for a while, but it'll be on the GitHub soon for sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Brock, what, can you try to just repeat the question? Because oh we yes, still have people yeah. on the stream, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Nathan with the roaming mic has run away. Okay, so sure. the, the previous He's question... He's probably wherever the badges were this morning. The previous question was uh, about um, c if you don't have the Play Store, can you use it? W what do you do? Um, and and the answer is yes, but we don't have the APK hosted yet. Yeah, and I then put that this question yeah. is about, hey, this is not a normal device. We don't have a keyboard and such and a mouse. So what does the user do to interface? Um, and yeah, the answer to that is uh, I don't really know. I, users will do what users will do. I personally uh, have a couple tricks to get around using a keyboard on my device because I also have to interact with the app. Um, so for instance, there's um, kind of an application called Wi-Fi keyboard that'll let you hook up through a Wi-Fi network to it. And then you can use uh, your computer keyboard to kind of type on the device defeats the purpose a little bit um, of just using it on the device, but kind of similarly, there's another application called Screen Copy, which will like host your um, Yeah, it's your S -C -R -C -P -Y Android device. Yeah, it's S-C-R-C-P-Y, if you're searching for it. Screen yeah, it'll copy. just host your Android device right on your screen, which doesn't really defeat the, per uh, defeat the issue of not having access to those things if this is your only device. But I don't know the that it's really an issue we can solve without starting to sell hardware. So but the average user, if you're not aware with what the average user does, the average user um, just uses the on-screen keyboard that you would use in any other app. In addition, uh, like the VNC clients support you know, finger gestures and things like that that allow you to do single or double click. Um, so I actually normally use UserLand just on my device without anything extra. I have used it with a Bluetooth keyboard, and that works kind of swell. Um, uh, if you're a tablet user, you might the keyboard interface might work a little bit better, but we have people using it in all different environments. Okay, so the question was, we, we were beta testing for quite a while, and what was the most interesting uh, feedback we got that changed our development going forward? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of our feedback isn't uh, entirely useful, especially because you know people will often just get angry that something doesn't exist that they would like to exist. But something that we saw on our GitHub time and time again was that people were trying to get Firefox running um, on their distributions. This was before we had apps, um, because that's the feature we released as we moved into production. And so, you know that. That was one that we wanted to make sure was in there so that people could more easily access that. Yeah, I think I can think of one example. Um, we it wasn't through our for through our beta, it was through our beta feed work. We had a lot of people like originally we didn't have the app page. We just had like sessions and we had file systems and you would um, 
have to create a session manually. And it wasn't that people were saying this manual thing doesn't work for me. It was uh, people, especially foreign language users, who were like, what do I do, right? Because there's too much text involved. And so we're like, we need to make this simple, right? So we added the apps page, and that made it so like, the f you would see the Debian logo right when you loaded it. So you're like, what do I do? I click the Debian logo, right? Like, even if you don't speak English, you probably will at least try to click on that, and that actually will do what you want. Um, so we, we did get some interesting feedback in for as like usability, just from people saying, uh, what? Right, and that's actually kind of an area that we're still struggling in. Um, so for instance, when you run an app for the first time, we request some credentials like username and password so that we can generate the file system that everything's gonna be running on. And that's still kind of all text-based. Um, and we can't translate that. And some of those things, it's hard to convey through images what exactly we're asking for. Um, and so it's still a little bit of a sticking point. But there's just not a lot that we feel we can do there. Are we out of time? Or should we go keep going with questions? We can probably pause for another question if you want. All right, one last one. Any takers? I got someone right here. So yeah, we're open source. Um, it, the question the was about, can I bring oh, my own sorry. distribution? Yeah. Um, so all the distributions that we've made, you can see how we're doing that by going through our GitHub repos. Um, obviously, if you were gonna build the app and run it on your own device, you could then insert those really easily. But if you make one and you send us a PR, like chances are we'll work with you to make it ready for the yeah, world. Yeah, I'd love that. Now, as far as like a feature just to like click, like, you know, uh, load your own tar file, you know, or whatever. Uh, we don't have that, it's not in the roadmap, but that's actually very interesting. We've talked about it before. Um, I'd be happy to, you know, someone, especially if someone wanted to jump in to do some of the work involved with it, I'd be happy to have that. Um, custom distros would be kind of cool. All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>